And in our Bibles, we'll look at uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians 4, verse 4. And I thought since it's our, our purpose for the next five weeks or so to have a, a study in the book of Philippians during our midweek time, I would use my time with you this morning just as an introduction uh, for that study on our midweek coming up. So you just turn to Philippians 4.4. 4. There was, um, it was a couple, well, probably a couple of months ago now, I was... I was out across, I was at the estate across the way. And as I was coming back, there was a car parked by our front gate. And um, usually you don't think that's, that might not be anything of, of much importance, whatever, but um, because we've had a lot of dodgy characters coming and going throughout the property here, my alarm bells went off and I saw this car just sitting there. So I thought, hmm, I better just duck in and, and see if I can help them or what they're about. So I, I, I went up to the car, and there was children in the back, and a guy and a lady up front. And uh, here they were lost. And here they had flown in from another country. I guess it was a rental car or whatever, and they were, they were going to a hotel in Kildare, and they needed help getting, getting there. So um, we got to speak with them a little bit, and Brenda and I, we escorted them to the place. But the reason they had flown in was because uh, Newbridge Silver is having this thing on Kurt Cobain, or Corbain, if I'm saying his name right. And um, so that was enough for them to want to fly over and do all that so they could go see Kurt Corbain stuff. I don't know too much about him. He's kind of, um, my, uh, my carnality kind of stopped with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and I came to faith in Christ and by God's grace he delivered me from all that and then all these other guys afterwards, Kurt Corbain and all that, I don't know too much about them. But um, so it was uh, this last week, Brenda and I, we had our 36th wedding anniversary. Praise God. And so on our anniversary, we go out and have a little lunch or something together. So uh, we, had a, we had some money left over on a gift certificate for New Bridge Silver. So we went over there and I said, ooh, look at that, look at that blue car. There was a blue car out front and all this whatever up above there and the pictures of Kurt. And uh, so I went, we went there, I got to look at this old Dodge car and went in there and all that. And we didn't go to the museum, all his paraphernalia is up front, upstairs, I think you have to pay and all that. But um, what little bit I do know about him was he was a very sad character. And um, from what I imagine, his, uh, his songs and his lyrics, they may have been of a depressing down nature from what I might understand there if I do it correctly. But sadly, um, he was a drug addict and he committed suicide in the 1990s. And I just don't know why, I don't know, the world goes after something, this poor man, the, the stresses and the strains of this world were just so strong and heavy upon him. And in spite of success and everything else, he did what he did and um, the, the Lord Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation, and but the rest of it was be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And to have tribulation and not have good cheer because you don't know the one who has overcome the world, it can be uh, destructive and indeed fatal. And the world we do live in, and has been kind of touched on here during our, our worship time, there is stresses and there's strain and there's pressures and there's heaviness all about us, um, the world politically, the political situation, the things Anto was sharing there, and we wash ourselves in the news and it's negative, negative, negative. Um, we live in a, a sinful world about us where all the stresses and the strains and the heartbreak are about us, and even in our own homes, um, we have things that, that, go on, that happen to us that are just can cause us to be very sad. But praise the Lord, we do have a hope. And in Philippians, there's just chock full of blessings. There's so many verses within the book of Philippians that, that give us hope, that give us cause to indeed to lift up our eyes, not just up to the hills, but to beyond the hills, the one who made heaven and earth. 
And we have strong hope and strong consolation in the book of Philippians. Something, all the, the letters in our New Testament, um, whatever they may be, Romans, Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, um, many of them written by the Apostle Paul, you know, the, the one, the Holy Spirit through Paul had written them. But it's something how the letters, they have their own personality. They have their own character. They have their own meaning and purpose. Each one, if you go to Romans or Corinthians, first or second Corinthians or whatever. And when we come to Philippians, we can get the background in Acts chapter 16. We get to see Timothy introduced to us. We get to see how the Holy Spirit led Paul to Macedonia and then to Philippi. Uh, we're introduced to, to Lydia, the seller of purple. We're introduced to uh, the slave girl who was into the occult. We're introduced to the jailer who cried out in his distress, what must I do to be saved? And those blessed words that, that come down to you and me through Paul speaking to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this uh, letter to Philippians, just full of hope, so full of joy, I've kind of written down here um, some of the, the things, like the words joy and rejoice some 18 times. We see those words joy and rejoice 18 times through this little letter. Mind or think, what you ought to think about, what kind of mind you ought to have in this age and, and in this world. Some 13 times the word mind or think think is mentioned. Now, it would be something if, um, like in the world in which we live in, if uh, Jeff Bezos, if I'm saying his name right, the gazillionaire with Amazon, if he were to tell you everything's going to be okay, you know, just have a happy outlook. You say, yeah, that's great for you to think of. You have more money than you can, uh, than I could think of, or, or that's ever, you'll ever be needed in a thousand lifetimes or some political figure that has everybody kowtowing to him for his every wish and his every desire, for them to write something like this to give us hope. You say, that's good for you to say. But when we come to Philippians, Paul's in jail. He's imprisoned. Matter, of, We do remember in Philippians here, he was beaten and put in the stocks there with, with uh, Silas. The, the Philippians, from what we gather uh, elsewhere in a Bible, in, in our Bible, in um, 2 Corinthians, Paul speaks about those in Macedonia had in their deep poverty, deep poverty. It's not like, well, they weren't really the, the wealthiest, they weren't the richest, but they had poverty and it was deep poverty. They were in a culture that was a Roman colony, even though it was in Macedonia there, where to be Roman was to worship Roman gods, to keep the Roman customs in the culture. And so here they were, I would assume, disenfranchised, set apart in their own little city and town there, and deep poverty. So this man who's in prison is writing to people that are in deep poverty and really not accepted in the culture there, and we read, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. When I um, was originally going to uh, put these few thoughts together for you today. I thought, well, there's so many promises in Philippians, maybe I'll pick 10 out, and we'll just lightly touch on 10 of them there. And then after a while, I, wow, this is too much. You know, in Psalm 68, the Lord daily uh, burdens us with benefits. There's just so many blessings and promises here. And uh, so I've just kind of restricted to, I think, just three in chapter four. But if we were to go uh, through it all, just in uh, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And later on in the chapter, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, or to depart and to be with Christ is far better. In chapter 2, verse 13, um, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for you know, it is God who is in you both to will and to do 
his good pleasure. Philippians 3, 8, forgetting those things that are behind. To me, that means forgetting all my faults, all the times I've let others down, myself down, most of all when I've sinned against the Lord, when I've blown it. Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to what is before, pressing on. Wow, what a comfort and what a blessing. And then in chapter 4 here, we have rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In uh, chapter, or I'm sorry, in chapter 4, verse 6, be anxious. Don't worry about anything, but everything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And we read, and the God of peace, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your minds and your hearts through Christ Jesus. Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever state I am, whether I have lots or whether I have little, I've learned to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus, and so on and so forth throughout the book here. So I'm just going to look at three today, hopefully to kind of to draw us in, to suck us in to the book of Philippians and make it a matter of, of study for the next few weeks here on our midweek. But the, the first verse here that we've looked at, Philippians 4, uh, verse 4 here, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. When I uh, read that, it reminds me of something about myself and I think is true of many people. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, Paul says it two times in that one verse alone there. And that is speaking for myself, I am negative by default. I'm negative by default. Whatever what circumstance comes to me or whatever decisions I have to make or how I judge things or do things, I usually take it negatively. Indeed, back in, um, in chapter 2, we're told not to complain, not to murmur, not to grumble. I'll tell you, that is, that's true of me. Naturally, by default, things cut across my path. Things don't go the way I think they should go. I grumble and I complain and I, and I murmur. I'll give you a case in point. Um, Brenda and I, we were in Dublin this last week and it was kind of getting on long in the day coming home and I was tired. And I was looking forward to coming home. Got off the M50, get on the N7, start seeing these notices, collision ahead, collision ahead. Oh no, wrath cool, collision. Oh. Basically come to a stop or to a crawl. Oh, I was not happy not happy <laughs> trust me I was grumbling I was miserable Brenda would try to talk to me and I would kind of answer huh. <laughs> you know huh. yeah mm. you know what and I just like being miserable tried to uh, do a detour to kind of go around another way to get home bumper to bumper not happy. <laughs> trust me. not happy and so as I'm miserable here, you know, and I'm crawling along and all that, it kind of dawned on me, you know, I have a decision to make. By default, I'm grumbly, I'm complaining, I'm not happy. But I don't have to be. I can decide, I can choose to not let this bring me down. And that's what I did. And uh, so I began to increase my vocabulary to Brenda from a, huh, mm. You know, to say a few things. Christina, it sounds like you've been there with somebody. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get you or myself in trouble. But, um, so, but we're told here to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, to choose to rejoice. Um, I think it was Abraham Lincoln that's, that he had said that he had thought that everyone uh, is about as happy as they want to be, you know, it's so not to bank on Abraham Lincoln here, but to rejoice, to have a mind that is rejoicing and not by default to be complaining and to be uh, grumbling. In Nehemiah 8.10, we 
we're told that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Right? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And that the joy of our, the Lord is our strength. And we already looked at it. I quoted what the Lord Jesus said in John there. That in the world, you will have tribulation. We're going to have tribulation politically. We're going to have tribulation in our workplace. We're going to have tribulation in school. We're going to, in this world, we will have, we have tribulation. But the Lord Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we lift up our eyes, not just to the hills, beyond the hills and on up and upward. We look and see him there. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Sometimes, some time ago, I was watching the news, and it had something to do with Queen Elizabeth. And if I remember right, she was in Windsor Castle or Balmoral or whatever it was there. And wherever she goes, whether it's Balmoral or Windsor, there's a special flag. And when she's in residence, the flag goes up. So you just know that there's the queen's flag over the castle. That means the queen is in residence there. Maybe you know where I'm going with this. And I remember when I was um, uh, a young Christian, about 19 years old, we were in Virginia and we were attending the church. People would come and collect us at the pier, the ship we were on, and they would take us out to their church. And one of the things that used to annoy me was the, um, the church we were going to, the pastor would call up the young people to have a young people's choir. So all the, all the kids had to come on up. And he would always make me come up too. You know, I am 19 years old, I gotta come up with all these kids. And I guess maybe some of the other young men that were. So we would be up there in the, in the young choir. But, but one of the things I remember was they had the, the, the books out. And so all the young people, and I could join them then, at least they, I was drafted into it, we had to open up. And there was the song that we sang is that, Joy is the flag flown high in the castle of my heart when the king is in residence there. Remember that? Anybody know that song? Joy is the flag flown high. Ooh, this is going to go out of here. Was it? <laughs> yeah, but joy is the flag flown high from the castle of my heart when the king is in residence there. So let it fly in the sky. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know that the king is in residence there. And joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we're to show forth joy. I was thinking, when you go out into the workplace, into the school, or wherever it is you are in the world, and maybe you're not there too long before the world knows that there's something different about you as opposed to themselves. And it might be that you don't do this, or you do that, or you don't cheat here. And so the world looks at you, and they might say, well, you are a man, or you are a woman of ethics, or you are a person that's very religious because you don't speak like this and you don't go there and you, and, and whatever. And to them, it's just kind of religion, I assume, you know. You smell the smell I was telling you about in the church when you came in? But somehow, when it's just rules and I don't do this and I do that and all that, it kind of smells like that to the people about us, I think. It just means you got ethics or you got religion, maybe but there's something different when you have the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is being attractive. The joy of the Lord is there's something different about him or there's something different about her. The joy of the Lord is I need to know more. There's something beautiful about that fruit of the Spirit, the joy of the Lord. And we're told here to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice and we have that we sing that song as well so just this one little promise out of so many in philippians is to have a mind that i'm going to rejoice yes i'm not happy about this circumstance no what is happening to this loved one is bringing me down i'm sorrowful but i'm going to rejoice i'm not going to grumble i'm not going to complain that does not make an impression favorable for the lord jesus when those about me see me seeing me and hearing me grumble and complain about my circumstances, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. 
And um, as Andrew had said earlier there, we have that wonderful promise there. Cast your burdens upon the Lord and he will sustain you. I was, um, I put some, uh, ver- I was looking up some verses here in, in Psalm. It's just that, you know, remember there, there was that song, uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy? Uh, boom, 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 you know, don't worry, be happy. You know, it's almost like be a dummy, you know, but that's not what we're talking about here. I was thinking when we go through the Psalms, uh, David was cast down. If I could use it, David was oppressed. David knew what the stress and strain was uh, from his own failures, from the failures of his family, politically, enemies about him there. And uh, in Psalm 42, uh, at least three times we hear, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are, and why are you disquieted within me? And again, it says, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. And again, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Have you ever felt like that? Maybe you're seated seated here today and you feel like that at this very moment. You feel cast down, disquieted within you, within yourself there. But he goes on to say he's not going to remain there. He's not going to stay like that. He speak him to himself. And that's something. He's his own therapist here. He's saying, why are you cast down, David? He says, oh, my soul, why are you disquieted within me? And he tells himself and from himself to you and to me, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And he says, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And in Psalm 43, verse 5, again, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And later on, David says, throughout different times in Psalm 119, um, about hoping in the word of the Lord. That's what we're doing here this morning, remembering the word that we might have hope. And I wait in Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. Uh, Another promise here in verse six of Philippians four, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I read a, a newspaper article. It was, well, quite a few years, 2013, so about five years or so ago, in the Irish Examiner. And there was a, a young lady by the name of Neve Dorhan, if I'm remembering her name correctly here. And she was a, a journalist. But she wanted to do, I guess you would say, an investigation or an experiment. So being a young lady, uh, looking like she was in college age, she decided to, for the purposes of her research, to make herself a young lady in college, in the last year of college, who had a lot of stress and strain in her last year of college with different symptoms of such. So she was in the Waterford area, and this was in the Irish Examiner 2013, and she chose out seven GPs in the Waterford area, and none of them had met her before or knew anything about her. So she went to each one, I think it was four male doctors and three female doctors, and she told them that she was a college student last year, depressed or whatever. All seven Uh, prescribed her antidepressants, and only one spent time with her to talk with her to figure out why she was feeling the way she was. Well, it was almost a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, Six out of the seven, just write the prescription, off you go. And only one really took the time to kind of listen and to see uh, what was happening in her life. And he, too, prescribed the uh, antidepressant to her. And what she had said in the article was when it was all over, she had about 20 months worth of antidepressants 
from all of these uh, doctors that just need, with a knee jerk, just pass them on to her. And I kind of thought, how sad. I mean, I don't know. Um, what I do know is with her uh, pretending to be depressed and all of that, but we do live in, a, in an age with these stresses and these strains. And here we see in Philippians 4, 6, this is God's prescription. I'm not a doctor. I'm not saying who should and who shouldn't about the other thing there. But I know for myself that when I'm anxious and I have anxieties and I, I, I am anxious at times and I do have anxieties at times, but I'm told like David to, to hope in God's word. I'm told that when I'm anxious to pray and to make my supplications known to him. The verse doesn't, does not say, be anxious and do nothing. The verse says, when you're anxious, be anxious for nothing, and in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Uh, many years ago, that we had a, a great thing that was a stress and a strain and, and a burden to us. This would have been 20 some odd years ago, I suppose. I remember, maybe you've been there too, or you've had so much anxiety you can't sleep at night. And this was up, I was maybe one in the morning and I couldn't sleep because I kept thinking. I remember what I was going through, someone sometime before told me, then what? Then what? In other words, what happens when the money runs out? You know, then what? And anxiety is a fear of the future of what might happen. And I remember his words, then what? Then what? Because of the decision I made, what I thought was good. And, um, oh, the anxiety. Instead of just sitting there, laying there in bed and tossing and turning and worrying, I remember slipping out, just going on the floor before God and just praying and pouring my heart out to the Lord. I've had correspondence in the past that was very distressing to me. You remember Hezekiah, if you recall, back in your Old Testament, reading Car, receiving correspondence that was very distressive, very a great cause of anxiety. And he took that and he brought it before the Lord, the paper itself, and he prayed or the scroll, whatever it was there. And that's what we're told in Philippians, to be anxious for nothing about what might happen, what might be. Not to be anxious, but to pray and to bring our supplications to God and and in doing so, that God will guard our hearts and our minds, and his peace uh, will be with us. I told you about I was driving, and I was grumbly and complaining. I guess I learned a lot of theology in my car. So another time, this isn't uh, very long ago, um, there were two situations that were before me that were causing me anxiety. It was causing me stress and strain and, and uh, worry. And I was in the car, and I was thinking about these things that were about to come upon me here in the next week or so, and I was quite anxious. And I thought, Philippians 4, 6, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your, make your request to God and the peace of God and how it goes on will guard your minds. And I thought, and I was still anxious, and I was still worrying. And it dawned on me, here I know the verse, here I have the verse memorized, and it still wasn't doing me any good, and it wasn't a magic bullet just because I had it memorized. I had to apply it, I had to embrace it, and I had to mix it with faith. Remember in Hebrews, it's talked about those, those Hebrews that the gospel was preached to them, but it didn't do them any good because it wasn't mixed with faith. And that's true with any promise of God, that it has to be mixed with faith. And then and there, in my car, I realized, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Make my request known to God with thanksgiving there. And I figured I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to pray. And I laid hold on God, and I prayed, and I prayed day after day. I made it a matter of prayer. And I could give you other examples of my own personal life, and most likely you could too. And by just the exercise of praying and looking to God and casting my burden onto him, it was a relief. It did uh, lift the burden from me there. And one of the situations was one that it looked like 
it was headed in a direction that it would be a miracle if it didn't happen. I mean, the odds were 99 to 100. But you know what? I said, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray and lay hold on God. And it didn't come to pass. I said, what a relief and what a blessing and what a praise. And we're told there. Now I'm looking at a clock, and the clock is ticking, and I keep talking. And I was going to talk a little bit about uh, think on these things, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And I was going to speak at length on that a little bit but it's probably best I don't because I've gone on quite a bit here. But anyway, what I'd like to do for the next five weeks is in our midweek, look at the book of Philippians. I would like us to be infused, like a tea bag in the hot water. You know, the tea bag's in there. It's in the water and the water is in the tea bag. And and in Philippians for these next five weeks and all these beautiful promises and these words of blessing and comfort we have, to be in the book of Philippians, and the book of Philippians will be in us, just to infuse ourselves in the book there. Um, many years ago, a fella told a joke on the railroad. It was one of these corny jokes. But the corny joke went that in this prison, I guess in this men's prison, they just kept recycling the same jokes over and over again, the same jokes. So what the prisoners did, they assigned a number to each joke so they wouldn't have to tell the whole joke. So the, the, the story goes that in the prison, all the men are in their cells at night, and someone calls out from one cell to the rest of them, number 13, and they all start laughing. Right? Another guy says, 22, and they all start laughing. because they know. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful that as we go through the stresses and the strains of this, the tribulation that the Lord Jesus says we're going to have in this world, we could just say, one six, ah, thank you. Four eight, great, thank you. You know, um, three eight, or whatever it might be, and right there, we're, we're so into the book, we know what one six is, being confident that, that he who began the good work in me is gonna perform it until the day of the Lord Jesus. Or four six, be anxious for nothing, that in everything by prayer and supplication make your request known to God. Four four, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice in whatever it might be there. So, for the next uh, five weeks, that's what I hope to be in to study in. And what I'm going to do, um, there's no curriculum here. It's just going to be as a uh, one. One teacher of old said, the naked word. So we're going to be in the naked word, the Philippians, no curriculum or anything like that. But uh, what I've begun to do is I have the book typed out so I can, I can write my notes, I can write cross-references on it or my, my thoughts. And, and so I'm going to have this printed up with the whole book of Philippians because if you do this to your Bible, you're going to, you'll scribble it into oblivion. So if you're going to join us for the study, if you could let me know, you just put your name down, and what Bible version is your heart version? What version is it that you read devotionally and that you read? And I'll try to make this up for you as well. Um, and then if Tuesday at 7.30 in the evening doesn't work for you, and if you would still like to get together, if you give me an alternative day and time that would be more agreeable for you, um, we'll see what we can do there. So I'll have these posted or laying about here, and you can put your name and if you would care to join us, and I hope you will. Patrick, 4-4. Four, four. No? Well, that's why you got to come to the study. Hmm, who's another victim? Douglas, 4-4. Four, four. It's a tough crowd. Thank you, Douglas. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. And as we come to communion, one of, the, one of the blessings going through the book will not just be looking at the promises of God and his great comfort to us here, but the one from whom all of these blessings spring from. All these blessings have their source in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his work for us. And as we go to communion, 
And towards the close of our service this morning, I'll just start in reading in Philippians 2, uh, verses 5 uh, to 11. And we read in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think we read in effect in our New Testament where it says that the things written aforetime were written for our learning, that by uh, patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. And we thank you, Father, for the hope the blessed hope that you have given to us through the Lord Jesus, Lord, that you are our God, even unto death. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who tasted death for every man, that we indeed, because of our faith in him, might be able to also say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, and to depart and to be with Christ is far better. And the Lord Jesus said, this do in memory of me. And Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for providing us a, a faithful and a merciful high priest who knew sorrow and who knew difficulty and tribulation, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We remember how his soul was sorrowful even unto death. And we thank you, Lord, that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. And the Lord Jesus said, this do in memory of me. Okay, we'll stand and we'll close with number 44, please. It's the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, we will rejoice. Be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord See? 
is the day, this is the day when the Spirit reigns. Remember that song shall go forth in peace, and where we do pray that we will indeed go forth rejoicing and in peace because of Calvary and the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your word where you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we commend ourselves to you and your grace. Amen.